introducing today's guest on this installment of Real Talk with Tehran Poole. I'd like to mention that this is someone whose commentary on the American Muslim community I've followed for at least the last five years in whatever way I could, and whose thoughts articulated many of the things I experienced and witnessed as a Black American having converted to Islam in the Bay Area of California. Uh, by looking at what I could of his journey from when he converted to Islam in the early 90s to where he is today, this seems to be someone who has kept people guessing at almost every step of his progression, whilst providing a very raw and insightful, as well as entertaining point of view concerning the sociology of religion in an American Muslim setting. He is an American writer hailing from the city of St. Louis, Missouri, a media personality, political activist, and uh, peace be upon you, Umar Lee, and thank you for accepting my invitation to my platform for the discussion that will ensue. My pleasure to be here. Uh, interesting guy, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Definitely, definitely. All right, so let's get into it. And, uh, you know, if my memory serves me correctly, I first became aware of your commentary either sometime before the situation involving Siraj Wahaj, uh son or just a little bit before that. Anyhow, uh, what I found so attractive about your commentary was twofold. One, your diagnosis of religious life within contemporary Muslim America, and two, American Muslim life pre and post 9-11, along with how the discourse had changed during the transition from one period to another. So uh, to begin with, what attracted you to Islam in the first place, especially from what I understand you have been, uh, you converted at a very uh, early age relative to most converts? I converted at age 17, um, but I really became interested when I was 16. Um, my initial interest in Islam, there were two influences. Um, there was the reading the autobiography of Malcolm X. And if you talk to people in my generation, there are so many people that converted after reading the autobiography of Malcolm X. Mm. You get to the chapter on Hajj, you know, it's very inspirational. And second, the popularity of Islamic terms and phrases within conscious hip hop, out of, mostly out of New York. And so it kind of put Islam on the radar. You know, it, it, by the way, my name is messed up, Umar L. <laughs> so, I, I think uh, so, with some of my audience, you might already be well known. So uh, I don't think okay, you have to worry about right. it. <laughs> All right. So um, that was the primary um, uh, inspiration. You know, I came from a you know a Southern Baptist upbringing, but you know I drifted away from the church probably when I was around 12, 13 and got into the streets and was out drinking, smoking weed, getting in trouble, got arrested numerous times in that time period. Uh, the only thing that really kept me uh, out of serious legal trouble was I was a wrestler. So I wanted to, to stay academically eligible in order to compete uh, and had a very strong influence on my wrestling coach, Charlie Sherrod Sr. Um, but even then, I, ended, I still ended up getting kicked out of school, but it was uh, that which kind of gave me some guidance. Um, Growing up in North St. Louis County was very racially uh, divided. Uh, and, you know, uh, there's a trauma associated with that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a trauma that, that kind of everyone is sharing, but have a different vantage point. Uh, you know, um, you know, my family is a non-traditional, my dad's side is a very uh, white blue collar family, you know, raised primarily by my grandparents. You know, my grandfather's a World War II veteran of the first Marine division, you know, Battle Peleliu, Battle, Battle Okinawa, uh, et cetera. Uh, my grandmother was a Southern Baptist homemaker uh, from the Boot Hill, Southeastern Missouri, or Missouri, as they would say. And um, my, my dad was a factory worker. Uh, but my, in my mother's uh, side, uh, uh, my, you know, you know, after her and my dad split, when I was a toddler, you know, uh, she basically becomes involved with a black man from that point on. Uh, until the time of her murder uh, in uh, in 2018, and um, uh, and so my younger siblings are are biracial, mm. and so I kind of had you know this kind of different um, uh, situation going on, uh, even though there was this stark racial division. So you'll find like a lot of white converts in my generation were inspired to come to Islam because Malcolm presented it as a universal brotherhood. Well, we could kind of escape this racial binary of America 
uh, and uh, Islam was the vehicle uh, to do that. So our, our motivations were primary sociological uh, and not theological, the theology came later. You know, and I do want to ask uh, another question about that time, because um, uh, it appears that you had converted in the early 90s. I wonder what was yeah. the literature like around that time? Was it more so uh, you found a teacher to teach you about Islam? You attend lectures. Um, was did, was there a prevalence of uh, write, uh, written materials going around like what you see today? Or was it more difficult to come across? It was definitely more difficult to come across. But, you know, you had... Uh, uh, like a Muslim bookstore at a masjid, or you travel to Chicago and they would have bigger Muslim bookstores, uh, or there would be flyers and, and, and literature distributed at the masjid. And then you would get mailed these catalogs from Muslim bookstores. And, mm -hmm. and you kind of browse these catalogs from the Muslim bookstore, ordered books online. Some of these people were shady, like you'd pay your money, you'd never get your books. So that was a big <laughs> problem at the time as well. But when you go to these Muslim conventions like ISNA, or later IANA and QSS, the Salafi conferences, or whatever your thing was, you would typically do a lot of book shopping there. Mm -hmm. Also, just being in the masjid was a lot more important. You know, we have a lot of Muslims now that are very centered in their Muslim identity, but don't spend a lot of time in the masjid. Well, if you wanted to talk to Muslims and see Muslims, you had to be in the masjid. So it was very common to see people praying in the masjid three, four, five times a day at that time, and then staying after, in between Maghrib and Isha at the masjid and then after Isha. So people were just spending a lot more physical time around Muslims and spending a lot more time in the masjid. Um, and so uh, St. Louis is kind of a backwater. You know, we had two masjids. We had the WD joint, and then we had what was called the Islamic Center. And the Islamic Center was basically where all the immigrants went, quote unquote, and the, uh, and at that time, there were really no Im immigrant kids of my age. They were like all older, or they were like little kids. So like, I was in like a donut hole, where the only Muslims around me were African-American and the people that were going to the Islamic Center were those that um, uh, didn't really feel the vibe at the WD Masjid mm. or they were trying to seek a little more, quote unquote, of a Sunni orientation. This was before the Salafis kicked off, but they were, you know, they were just a little more in the Hadith uh, and things of that nature. OK. Uh, and can you describe the vibe and atmosphere of the 90s? Because a few times in previous interviews, I've heard you call it like a golden age of Islam in America. So, uh, yeah. yeah, if you don't mind just describing what the atmosphere was like. Well, it, much different. So, uh, number one, um, you had a big influx of conversions in the early 90s. Mm. OK, and really starting in the late 80s, but mostly in the, in the early 90s. So you had a lot of energy because Islam was very popular, especially in the black community. And so you had a lot of people coming in and Islam had a very good reputation. Mm. Um, and it, it, the, the reputation of Islam is not as good as it was at that time uh, in the hood because now when people think of Islam, they're more associated with the, the liquor store or the corner store or yeah, something yeah. like that. But that time they had a positive uh, connotation of Islam. Secondly, uh, the Muslim community throughout the nineties in America and up until 9-11 was much more aggressive, assertive. There was a lot more dawah, unapologetic dawah going on, unapologetic Muslimness going on. Uh, there wasn't the focus on politics and identity politics there is today. There wasn't the focus on uh, um, uh, interfaith that there is today or PR. The Muslim community after 9-11 became PR driven. Mm. And uh, PR driven community, you had to really discard those things which were negative uh, for, for public relations. Uh, so the Muslims were a lot more aggressive. Uh, you know, uh, voting was seen as controversial. Uh, you know, because uh, a lot of people believe it was haram to vote. Some people, like Zaid Shakir, said it was shirk uh, to vote. Uh, in the, and uh, uh, there was this uh, Muslim supremacist vibe that this is the haq, this is the way, and everything else is bottom, right? So this was the vibe. Uh, on in the immigrant congregations, you had the with the Arabs very much the Iqwani influence. And, the, and, 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 and with the uh, Daisies, the Maldudi influence, uh, and with the, and, and as the 90s progressed in the black community, especially among younger Muslims, the Salafi Dawah became prominent, less so in California and the West Coast, yeah. but definitely on the East Coast, and that reverberated throughout the South and the Midwest. Yeah, that's funny that you had mentioned that because when I first converted to Islam, it was at Talif Collective, and uh, they have more of a, a Sufi vibe. 
And right. for me, I really wasn't feeling the whole Sufi thing. And I kind of went a little left towards the, even though I didn't identify or call myself a, a Salafi, uh, I more so identified with that kind of way of understanding the religion, which kind of made me a bit of an outlier within that community. So after my first two years of being a Muslim, I was kind of out on my own. But I am interested, when you first became Muslim, was Salafi Dawah pre prevalent, or when uh, did it come uh, into picture? And and how did you feel Louis, taking shape? Yeah, St. Louis is, is always late to any trend. So there was nothing Salafi going on in St. Louis, really into the 2000s. Uh, um, I became exposed to Salafi Dawah um, when I uh, moved to Washington, D.C. area, and then New York City. Uh, and the Salafis were strong all the way from North Virginia, New York City, that core, North Virginia, D.C., Maryland, uh, Philadelphia, New Jersey, Brooklyn, you know, New York. The Salafis were strong there and they had energy. And coming from St. Louis, where you had very few Muslims and very little knowledge being disseminated among Muslim converts, and you go to the East Coast, you got people my age, they're speaking Arabic, they're reading Arabic, they got Muslim wives. Like, one of the issues in places like St. Louis is people traditionally had that difficulty finding wives because mm -hmm. not that many women were converting. That's why you get a lot of guys going over to Morocco to get married. And uh, um, I said, East Coast, this whole different vibe. Plus, it got like that East Coast swag, especially the New York guys and Philly guys. And, um, you know, it was, it was just something I kind of fell in love with, uh, you know, and uh, uh, I became popular and then later became popular in the Midwest. Our first real Sunnah teaching in St. Louis came when Shaykh Rahman Basir came here, mm. who's a Brooklyn native, but had been living in Oklahoma and Kansas. And he came to St. Louis and he never said the word Salafi not one time, but a lot of what he was teaching was Salafi material. Um, but he wasn't um, Salafi in the sense of the East Coast people were, where he was uh, following the, uh, the religious council and the major scholars in Saudi Arabia, or he was towing the Saudi line, or he was involved in internal um, uh, Saudi or Salafi politics because he was a political guy as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a, a political guy whose foundation came from black nationalism and the Panthers in the 60s. So he had, he was a, a good or bad. You know, he never worked, never had a paycheck. Uh, when he sat down with his wife, uh, they had a, a sit down. And she said, "What is your life goal?" And he said, "The destruction of Western civilization." So that you know that you know you know he was kind of that old school militant vibe, right? And so uh, post 9/11 is definitely somebody they wanted to keep in the closet, like keep this guy out the picture, right? So uh, that's in St. Louis who really started bringing knowledge to people with Sheikh Rahman. You know, so Hey Webb came here to St. Louis to live to uh, as a student of the Sheikh because he had converted with the Sheikh down in Oklahoma and uh, and Mujahid Abu Qatar. and um, and then you had some Saudi students who began distributing the Salafi books in St. Louis. Uh, and and uh, you had Zaid Tamimi, who was Sheikh Ali Tamimi's brother, who moved to St. Louis. And he began teaching the class, which I started attending. So I became more rooted learning about Salafi in St. Louis. But I was back and forth with the East Coast. And mm -hmm. so you were in Northern Virginia. You had kind of the, the bougie Salafi vibe, which is super international. You go to a class of Ali Tamimi or Jabba Sheikh Idris, you probably had people from 20 or 30 different nationalities and Hispanic converts to Islam, Jewish converts to Islam, Korean converts to Islam, black, white, it was just super diverse. Um, and then you'd go up, you go into the District of Columbia, you go into Philly, Jersey, and New York, and then you had the hood Salafi vibe, um, you know, which um, uh, was something in and of itself. The appeal of that, which has now moved to Philly, the epicenter, because of the gentrification of Brooklyn. And gentrification has played a major role in uh, what Islam is today in New York City. So with gentrification, you've had, you've had a decline in the African-American Muslim. But population. did it also contribute to what Philadelphia is as a, as a Muslim center uh, on the East Coast? It did. It okay. did, because a lot of the, the, the Brooklyn old heads ended up in Jersey and Philly. Mm. You know, and a lot of them moved to Atlanta, probably more in Atlanta than anywhere, but a lot of them ended up in, in Philly, New Jersey as well. Uh, but but if you look at history, Nation of Islam, the Dar, et cetera, they were always kind of connected, you know, marrying each other and stuff like yeah. that. And um, the Talif vibe is a different vibe. The yeah. Talif is a vibe that people in the State Department, people in academia could really get behind. It was seen as non-masculine. 
non-assertive, uh, non-threatening, middle-class, bougie, yeah. um, and uh, quite frankly, not that many African Americans involved. You know, and the East Coast seems too, too hood, too working class, too black, uh, and and too countercultural. So w- when they promote Muslim uh, celebrities, you know, you see Rami and and um, what's the new guy out of Houston? Um, uh, got the Netflix thing, whatever his name is. Yeah, I know what you're talking uh, about. And, and uh, but Freeway met with President Biden. Freeway, mm-hmm. Bing Siegel, Jack, for all the Philly Muslim MC, MCs, you know, um, or even if you go back, Kareem Abdul Jabbar and Ahmad Rashad, Ahmad Rashad taking Shahada here in St. Louis. But um, that's not what they wanted to promote because mm-hmm. it, it wasn't seen as something conducive to the mainstreaming of the Muslim community in America both because of theology to Salafi, race to black, and economics to working class. Yeah, definitely. That's the one thing that kind of, I don't want to say drove me away from Talif because I, I greatly appreciate, uh, you know, their convert care and how they really do try to look after the people who convert with them and stuff like that. But coming from my perspective, uh, you know, I, I didn't have a college education. A lot of the people, Muslims I was hanging around uh, were college educated uh, in careers during Ramadan, had uh, enough time saved up to where they can take two, three work weeks off of uh, off of work for Ramadan in order to fast and stay out late when I would try to do the same things. And it's like, man, I got to go to work uh, tomorrow morning. I can't exactly. stay up until Fudger. Exactly. So uh, their, yeah. whole family, their, their whole family dynamics is different. It's Definitely. a different thing. And I, I look in Chicago, Obedelai Evans, and I see Obedelai is the guy that can really bridge some of these things because, you know, he's a South Side Chicago guy. You know, he's got his bougie congregation at, at uh, Talif, but I, I see him as someone that can kind of pioneer something that could be beneficial to, to everyone. Yeah, you know, Us- Usama Cannon was trying to do that as well. You know, truth be told, my first iftar was uh, at Usama Cannon's house. Uh, at that time, I didn't know who he was in the community or anything like that. So I really wasn't paying too much attention to him. But as I, you know, kept coming around, then I, I understood. But uh, it still seemed to be that kind of divide. And that's what really your commentary, what made your commentary so attractive. Because I really couldn't put my thumb on the feeling I was getting while being there. But then when I heard you speak about the Muslim dynamics in America, then it was like, ah, you know, th- this is it. You know, it's not like... Um, you know, I do want to believe in the concept of a Uma, but there are uh, certain certain degrees or how they categorize people based on socioeconomics uh, and, and, and whatnot. So, um, but since you mentioned uh, Zaid uh, Al Tamimi, I would like to ask you a few questions about Sheikh Ali Tamimi, if that doesn't get us into too much trouble, because for myself, yeah. he really did play like uh, early on an uh, instrumental role in how I came to understand Islam. Uh, if you go and look on my YouTube channel, like I have seven of his lectures of Ibn Tamiya, uh, al Aqida Wasatiya uploaded uh, from- I got it on cassette tape, yeah. Yeah, yeah, from early on. And, yeah. you know, I was surprised uh reading into your biography watching uh, your material and reading your articles uh how many people uh, uh, uh big names from that era who you were or who you were around who unfortunately you know may have went off the the deep end or are stuck in some troubles but Sheikh Ali Tamimi uh what what kind of influence did did, did not influence but you know like what what kind of uh, how how did he come into the picture of, of Salafi Da? Because for me, he seemed like the the progenitor, or at least the poster boy, the face of Salafi Da for a long time, and and really helped kind of disseminate the uh, the material uh, for a lot of reasons. He was very articulate, he was very art- intelligent, and um, you know I'll let you I'll let you say all that because this is coming from my what I understand of him. So during that period, you had really two different Salafi lanes. You had a black lane that was very much dominated by Abu Muslima in East Orange, New Jersey, Dawood Ajib, who bounced around, but is a, is a Newark, New Jersey native, and Abu Osama, who's in the UK now, right? Yeah, in Liverpool. Three black, three black men from New Jersey uh, who uh, you know became educated, uh, and um, Abu Osama and uh, Abu Muslima graduating in Saudi Arabia. And uh, that would be not graduating, but probably being the most articulate of the three. Uh, Abu Osama. Dawood Adib, probably the best 
speaker was probably down with the deep, in my opinion. But they're all three good speakers. So they dominated the black uh in the black uh circuit. And uh the non-African American circuit, which had a lot of not non African Americans in it, by the way. So it was not like there were no African Americans. Ali Timimi and to a lesser extent people like Jamal Zidabozo, who was out in Colorado, um uh, Muhammad Slade Adley in South Carolina, who ca who came from Brooklyn, came, you know, uh, and brought a lot of people from New York down to South Carolina. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are kind of the ma some of the major uh, names. Uh, with Ali Tamimi, what I liked about him was uh, he didn't ignore politics, mm -hmm. he didn't ignore sociology. He addressed them, um, and I think he was moving in kind of a Salafi Juan direction uh, prior to his uh, prosecution. He had had very bad relations with Iquan early on, but I think he was moving closer, not of the heads of Iquan, but in the sense of Iquan of, of challenging uh, the rulers. Uh, he was moving uh, in that direction. But when you would sit and talk to him or go out to dinner with Sheikh Ali, um, he was a very smart guy, mm. very smart guy. And, um, and he, because once you kind of get into the Muslim thing, I had this international curiosity and I'm a bookish guy, so I'm reading about the world. And I had this thirst for knowledge about the Muslim world and people like Dawud Adib and Abu Osama and Abu Muslim were not concerned with that. They were concerned about giving the Dawa, giving Salafia to black Muslims in America. Mm. Ali Tamimi kind of puts you on another level where you're, you're thinking about yourself within the context of a global Ummah and, 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 and part of history. And uh, uh, that was the attraction. And there was a sense in the 90s that Muslims were ascendant. The Muslim community in America was growing. Mm -hmm. The, the Dawa was growing. The, popular, the popularity of embracing the Sunnah was growing. Uh, Sufis were very fringe. Um, uh, modernists were almost non-existent. And the Muslim world, there was a sense that Muslim groups would be taking over the majority of Muslim countries and creating Sharia uh, based states. Mm -hmm. So people were very confident in the 90s before 9 11, before the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan, et cetera. And, and that's why you say uh, this was an era that bred a generation heavily influenced by Islamist politics. Uh, it, it seemed to be m more of the norm then. The norm, not the exception. It was the norm. You know, you. The only articulation of international Muslim politics you heard was Islamist. Mm -hmm. uh, the left was silent or very fringe, and uh, the Islamists ruled. And you were either open Islamist or you were Salafi that were not part of an Islamic revival movement, uh, but your conception was that once the Dawah was strong everywhere, that societies would return to. Uh, this idealistic theocratic rule. You know, I wonder how much of an impact that had on, uh, say, the next generation when ISIS and, and other such groups uh, popped up, because, you know, um, that's the generation of Muslims, uh, or that's when I pretty much converted to Islam, 2013. Uh, something was happening, things were happening in Gaza. Uh, then all of a sudden, ISIS popped up. You know, I wonder if some of that discourse, or at least what kind of helped get ISIS support or such group support in the Muslim community uh, in the West, I wonder if such discourse kind of laid the foundation. I don't want to say responsible for, but kind of left some debris over into the next generation that kind of let things fester to where these things were okay. Because I, I noticed that people like Hamza Yusuf and a, a few other sheikhs from that era were real adamant on trying to put a lid on, on such stuff. So I just wanted to get your thoughts about that. Yeah, maybe... I think that's a little complex because what you see after 9-11 is basically the crimin criminalization of Islamist politics. Mm. So any articulation in support of that would make you a target of investigation or monitoring. And that void allowed the left to fill this void. At the same time, you have people like the Ford Foundation, Open Society, academic institutions investing in the creation of a, you know, more of a progressive Muslim stance, right? So you had external actors propping up this leftward turn in the American Muslim community where Muslims eventually would find a very small niche within the 
you know, progressive politics and, and Democratic Party. And so that became the dominate Muslim youth culture. Mm. Uh, at the same time, I think um, there was a reaction, especially from many young men, to the woke, newfound woke culture of Muslims. Uh, and, you know, that, you know, became evident in people like Daniel Akikita Jew and, and, and others who were expressing a discomfort with the, the new woke uh, public Muslim culture. And now the Muslim community is not that woke at all. Like mm -hmm. the, the actual Muslim community, not on Twitter, not on the internet, is about as far as woke as you can get. <laughs> but, but because of people like Linda Sarsu and others uh, had promotion from non-Muslims and these big entities and organizations, they were able to create a, pop, a degree of popularity, especially the young Muslim women for progressive woke politics. But the initial leftward turn for the Muslim community was a survival instinct. We have to work with liberals uh, to counter the Patriot Act, to counter the war in Iraq, to counter government surveillance. So it was a marriage of convenience, which in the, in the younger generation became an actual uh, a degree of uh, progressive uh, Muslim, especially with women. I would argue the popularity of ISIS uh, represent and, and the ISIS project represents the tail end of the Islamist revival. Mm -hmm. If you can say the Islamist revival begins in the late 1970s, um, you know, with the uh, the capture of the Haram in, in Mecca and the Tekfir wal Hijra in Egypt, et cetera, and the Islamist movement grows in popularity throughout the Muslim world, throughout the 80s, throughout the 90s, uh, and really throughout the aughts, I think that uh, the disaster of what Islamist rule became, uh, culminating in ISIS, has led to almost the complete death of the Islamist revivalist movement and Islamist politics. The attraction I think you saw from some loner, not just males, because we have a woman from Kansas, a white convert here in Kansas who held slaves, abused uh, people, uh, organized terrorist attacks, and she's a Muslim convert from Kansas. Mm -hmm. He's a teacher in the Muslim school in Kansas City. Allison Fluke Ekron, she's incarcerated right now. But mostly males, even though there's an exception such as her, uh, I think it was kind of a reaction to not liking the woke Muslim climate. And just, you know, a lot of young men in this era are disaffected. They're online all the time. Uh, you see it in this whole incel thing. You see it in all these uh, masculinity, you know, um, uh, um, hucksters. You know, mm -hmm. if you're an alpha, if you're a natural, first of all, if you're an alpha, you're born an alpha and you're bred an alpha. <laughs> you're never going to be a beta and then watch Andrew Tate videos and the Jordan Peterson transform. And become an alpha and then transform. You either got it or you don't. You know, it's natural. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so ISIS filled some of these voids, right? And I, th I, th I think they saw it as exciting, but also at the same time, because Islamist politics was driven underground, there were no real quote unquote moderate Islamist that could kind of like an Ali Tamimi that could keep these young people uh, away from the fringe of, of ISIS. Because Sheikh Ali would have never supported ISIS, right? You know, so, so you know, that's a response uh, to the void as well. Yeah, it seems like that totally did put a, a lid on any type of Islamist politics to the point that I heard a Christian missionary saying like, hey, this type of Islam isn't popular anymore. You know, we need yeah. to try to attack or turn towards uh, what seems to be a more progressive uh, strand uh, popping up. You see, you see a massive, the, the religion is declining in popularity in many Muslim countries, mm. including Saudi Arabia. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, and... Uh, you know, people are becoming less, the younger generation is becoming less religious. A lot of it's the influence of social media. They look on Instagram and TikTok and want to have all the fun that people in the West are having, right? And um, a lot of it's social media, uh, but a lot of it is also just, you know, uh, uh, the disaster, Taliban in Afghanistan, uh, ISIS in Iraq and Syria, uh, the terrorist attacks, you know, throughout the Muslim world, the terrorist attacks in the West by Muslims. And I think a lot of younger Muslims are just looking at this and saying, I don't want to be associated with this. Mm, definitely. And you know what? I also want to have a little bit of fun. You know, uh, you're telling me I can get, you know, 70 something virgins uh, 
I want, I, I want to get a few of them right now. <laughs> so, uh, so, right. you know, all these things going on. Yeah. And I, one thing that I really want to get into, and it's uh, this aspect of your journey, I feel is very inspiring is uh, journalism. You know, when, when, when did that, well, actually know when that start for you, if you go on, you have a Wikipedia page, it says you started in 2005. My Wikipedia is not actually all the way accurate, by the way. Okay, I was about to ask. So yeah. 2000, was it 2005 when you started uh, uh, um, journal, journalism, where you were addressing? I started blogging, but I had gotten some articles published in like Muslim publications prior to that, like the Muslim Observer. Okay. Uh, but uh, but 2005 is when it really begins. And I kind of have just two tracks with writing. I have my St. Louis track where I write for St. Louis publications and talk about St. Louis issues and St. Louis activism, St. Louis politics. And then I, and, and, and for a while, when I was living in New York, I was a professional boxing correspondent. So I was going to the fights and covering the fights. But the Muslim blogging in 2005 was a really in the Muslim community have become a known entity. And my brand from the beginning, the Muslim blogosphere was dominated by white Sufis pretty much mm -hmm. and others, right? Uh, but, but it was definitely more of a Sufi vibe. So they're like, oh, here comes the Salafi. <laughs> and then no one was, like there was this fake piety. No one talked about going to the movies or watching TV or watching sports. And so I started talking about all those things, which are common now. And people were saying, oh no, you can't talk about watching movies. You can't talk about watching TV. You can't talk about uh, sports, boxing, and baseball, and football, and wrestling. I said, hey, man, this is me. You're not going to get something fake. You're going to get something real. The problem in the Muslim community is it's a fake community, is everyone has this fake public persona. Then they go home and watch movies or do whatever the thing is or go on Tinder. Uh, and, and the whole thing is not being known publicly or not getting caught. So it's this fake religious piety. Yeah, We've seen it in the Catholic Church and other religions. They put on a mask. And I'm not playing it. Me, what you see is what you get. I like boxing. I like women. I like uh, a lot of other things. And we're not pretending to be something that I'm not. You know what I'm saying? You know, uh, that, that, you know that's one of the things that I kind of actually appreciate about UK Muslims. The ones that, you know, I don't, the sense I got with the Muslims where I came from in California and the sense that I get with the Muslims out here is like the ones out here who don't practice, they don't practice. They're not trying to put on for anybody as far as uh, trying to look pious for clout um, versus where I came from. Well, I only would engage with Muslims in the masjid when I was in California. I didn't have too many personal Muslim friends. So maybe that's probably why I didn't see it then and, and, I, and I see it now. But I definitely feel what you're saying in the sense that uh, a lot more Muslims are starting to uh, come out of their skin or come out the closet. I actually like the UK Muslim community because even though there's a lot of lunatics <laughs> out of, especially Birmingham, right? And there was a lot of ISIS people and jihadis out of the UK, right? And, um, you know, and there's been a lot of crazy stuff with Muslims just generally in the UK, you know, like this Hindu Muslim thing, the, uh, you know, this, there's yeah. always, kind of, always something crazy in the news, right? Um, and so there is a lot of extremism in the UK Muslim community. And, uh, uh, but also, man, the, the community is more blue collar, Thank, more yeah. real. You Thank know what I'm saying? So I vibe more, like there's a lot of British Muslim boxing fans. I mean, you'll hardly ever find a Desi guy in the U.S. as a boxing no. man, right? You, you know how right? many Muslims I found that were opposed to MMA when I was living yeah. in California? Out here, yeah. you have tons of Muslim MMA fighters, MMA, boxers. MMA, yeah, yeah. I mean, California especially, super super soft vibe. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so the, the uh, I mean, not California itself, because we know Oakland got killers, right? But I'm talking, yeah, about, yeah. The, I'm talking about the Muslim community, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but the, uh, um, uh, so I vibe culturally more with the U.K., that's why back in the day I was on the Muslim marriage app. I had a set to the UK. So give me a give me a hood London uh sister, you know what I'm saying? That we can, you know, we can practice chokeholds together <laughs> and uh, uh 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 submission chokeholds. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, not to upset the audience, you know what the halal yeah. kind. Yeah, okay. Well, I don't know if it's wrong, but you know, well, you know, yeah. yeah, man. Hey, if you ever visit London, you got to hit me up. I mean, although I'm further up north in Manchester, and I'm telling you, I think the north side of England is a lot better than than the southern because uh, it gets a lot better of big fights you... at the at the at the with the Emmy Arena, you know, and Tyson Fury lives up there, and Ricky Hatton was up there, and you know, w when I go, it'll be during a fight, so I'm gonna go and see a boxing match. Oh yeah, man, That's you got to hit me up. Goals. Yeah, but I almost went when I went because, you know, I just came here from Poland and Israel. I almost went to London and in Israel instead of Poland. 
So uh, it's definitely on the list. Yeah, because flights right now aren't that bad. I mean, even when I flew out, I, mean, I remember uh, looking at flights to London 2015 when a buddy of mine came out here for school and I was like, I, I can never afford to come out here. It was like 1200 something. But then when I, I checked again, 2016, I, I paid 400 pounds or $400 a round trip, which I was actually pretty surprised about that. Yeah. And you know, God, and God save the king, by the way, uh, King King Charles III, the new uh, monarch of the United Kingdom uh, and Northern Ireland. Uh, just had to send them a shout out. Yeah, you know, a lot of a lot of people are juiced about him uh, becoming king. So we're gonna see how uh, first perennialist are. king. They say the first perennialist king. Yep, yep. Uh, hopefully they change it. Who is it? Who you know? Back when I used to listen to a lot of uh, Islamist talks, uh, where um, one Muslim preacher had hoped that when Charles became king, that instead of defender of the faith, defender of faiths or something, you know, like a plural, uh, because, you know, I heard he has an affinity towards Islam, Hindu. Yeah, he definitely has a long and well-documented affinity, both for Muslims and Jews. So he's a, like when I went to the Jewish community center in Krakow, he opened that as Prince Charles III, excuse me, as Prince Charles, because he was in Poland and asked Hol Holocaust survivors if there's anything they could do for him. And they said, we'd like a place where we can just meet and talk. And so he helped to open the Jewish Community Center, which later, you know, just go, you know, now it's many different things going on there. It's like a center of the community. Uh, but he has a long affinity for Muslims. And uh, I think King Charles III is, is, will be a very positive uh, development for the Muslim community in the United Kingdom. Definitely, I hope so. And one thing I would like to talk, ask you about is is vlogging. Uh, your your time on YouTube. You know, I don't know anybody who has videos uploaded going fifteen years plus back. You you have to be the only one. Like, what what was it like? Uploading? And varied, by the way. Uh -huh. I got front line videos from the Ferguson uprising on the front line, battling with police, getting shot with tear gas. It's on there. I know. I got. I I got, I got videos at professional boxing matches. I got videos of all kind of Muslim content, uh, et cetera. So I, I would argue there's not that many people with content that varied uh, as mine. Definitely, definitely. And that, again, like that's what attracted me to your content um, was a lot of it, your Muslim commentary, but then I noticed that on there you had frontline Ferguson uh, footage mm -hmm. And whatnot. Right. You had uh, interviews with uh, Siraj Wahaj on there, um, even yeah. in your in your cabbie days, giving commentary. Uh, you know, it's yeah. real interesting to kind of see that development. From I hope you don't delete those videos because those are going to be real good. Uh, I delete some. I deleted some. I've deleted a lot of videos over the years. Just something I look at and I don't think it's kind of conducive to what I'm trying to do now or something like that, mm -hmm. right? Or like you know, I you know, I was still kind of coming out of like this Muslim militancy, and so some of those. You know, I went hard. I mean, just like Hamza, Hamza Yusuf. I mean, he got some quasi ISIS videos from like the yeah. 80s. They scrubbed them. They scrubbed a lot they of scrubbed them. them. They scrubbed a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. They scrubbed a lot of them. And Zayd, man, Zayd went hard too. And so, you know, some of those are on cassette tape. I know some people got them, but uh, I even uploaded some of them and I deleted it. I said, I want to make a problem for Zayd. But, mm -hmm. but I was just trying to illustrate how militant the Muslim community was, you know, when Zayd would get up talking about the dog bread cavern, you know, I mean, that was one of his things he liked to say, and uh, um, uh, that how the Muslim communities evolved. Because this is one of my problems with Hamza Yusuf is that um, you can go, you can evolve, and that's great. Malcolm was all about evolution, and my life has been all about evolution, right? I'm under no obligation to follow positions I did a year, five, 10, 15, 20 years ago. If we're not growing, something's wrong. Yeah, this puts us this puts us in a cultural um, adversarial position to most of the immigrant Muslim community because they're largely not about evolution; they're about preservation. Mm. You see what I'm trying to say? And and most of them come from cultures that are very conformist, and individuality is not celebrated. So it's whatever their religious understanding is; they just stick with it, no questions asked. Whatever their ethnicity is, stick with it, no questions asked, et cetera. And we're rebelling against our culture, rebelling against our upbringings from a totally different place. So I don't have a problem with Hamza Yusuf uh, uh, evolving, even though I personally don't like him, personally don't find his message appealing. I don't have a problem with his evolution. But show us the math. Mm -hmm. How did you get here? Yeah. And renunciate some of your previous positions. If I change, I'll tell people and I'll tell people why. Yeah. 
just don't pop up at the White House in a suit and don't say how you got there. Let people know. Yeah, be a bit, be a bit more transparent. Because I, I did notice when I first converted to Islam, uh, you know, it was a, it was around um, a few of Hamza Yusuf's uh, students and whatnot. You know, my first uh, molid, I didn't even know I was going to molid at the time. Uh, right. My first molid was uh, Hamza Yusuf and Zaid Shaker uh, speaking at it. But I, I did notice that he, he kind of went from a uh, liberal progressive hype to now more of a conservative uh you know no right wing feel um over the I have my theory I have my theory on that. So you know he started out like this kind of mystic Sufi militant hardcore mm. anti American you know explicitly explicitly anti American and uh and Zayd was kind of the same thing but on a black vibe. Mm. So Zayd was Imam of a hood master in New Haven where a lot of friends from St. Louis actually lived up there. And uh, Hamza had the kind of Bay Area, you know, that kind of rich kid Bay Area vibe, you know, the, and uh, the you know kind of the weather underground vibe, you know, <laughs> something like that. Right? And um, so he evolved after 9/11. And when you used to think of Zaytuna, you were thinking of the Muslim progressives, mm. the people that were very progressive on social issues. The people that it seemed like they were on a trajectory to lead kind of a progressive Muslim norm in America. And I think what happened with Hamza, I think, I think he, him, Suhaib Webb and others, and Suhaib is still trying to, we're trying to do that, but keep them within Islamic orthodoxy. Mm. So I'm trying to say, we'll move in a progressive direction. We'll move in a direction where, you know, we're, in, we're part of this democratic coalition uh, but we're going to, but we're, there's boundaries they won't cross and we'll stay within Islamic orthodoxy. Mm. And I think what Hamza saw, and I think what Zay saw, saw is they were no longer able to contain people within Islamic orthodoxy. They were just going on this progressive direction and shooting straight out of Islamic orthodoxy into kind of modern progressive Western secular humanist understanding where religion is really not needed unless it's as a tool within identity politics and this kind of bio POC intersectionality thing in the US, right? Mm -hmm. At that point, I think Hamza said, okay, we got to reel it back in and, and we got to focus on the culture wars and our natural allies in the culture wars are the conservatives. Yeah, yeah. and which is a very strange alliance, uh, especially you see how uh, more conservative Muslims have definitely become more friendly towards somebody like Jordan Peterson. When Jordan Peterson, to, from my perspective, seemed more like a perennialist than the type of person that a more conservative Muslim would be uh, interested in well, dealing with. Well, you got to also keep in mind is that this turn is completely destroying the Malcolm image of Islam. Mm. So in other words, to go to the right wing in America and to not be black, uh, it, it sends a message that you have a vision of Islam where there's no contradiction to supporting white racism. Mm. There's no contradiction to supporting white nationalism. And since what we see in the Ak right, when they're in bed with the white right, what they're saying is for us to progress, we got to throw African Americans, even African American Muslims, under the bus. Mm. And when black Muslims like Abdullah bin Hamad Ali get in that camp, they are changing the narrative from Malcolm and Farrakhan and Imam Siraj and others who are seen as the epitome of pro-blackness. And going into history, they're seen as the, uh, the Arab, the black servant mm. of the Arab slave master, you know, in terms of because if you go to the continent, the, Islam being pro-black was really a fiction mm. that Elijah Muhammad and Noble Dura Ali came with and furthered by the nation of Islam and kind of merged with the, the black Sunni movements through the Dawah of Islam, et cetera, right? Yeah, they thought well, it was always, a necessary myth in order to right. construct. Exactly. And, and even with the Salafis, not black nationalistic, but very black culturally, and part of the, the, part of the appeal of Islam is this is not the white man's religion, right? Mm. And a study of history is going to show you that 
Islam on the continent of Africa, definitely for many, is not seen as a pro-black thing. It seems a pro-Arab thing. Yeah. There's different ways to look at history, et cetera. But, uh, you know, uh, Abdullah bin Hamad Ali is basically playing the, the Candace Owens role, uh, the Kanye West role on the Muslim Chitlin circuit. So the Muslim tur- circuit is small, right? You know what I'm saying? But he's playing that role. Um, and that's why a lot of black converts of my age, they became disillusioned with Islam uh, because they viewed it uh, sociologically, the community is functioning anti black. Mm. And to them, he has been a poster child of that. Is you're, you're crying for Palestine, but where are your tears for the black community in the city that you live in? Definitely, because that's. You're, yeah. No, no, go ahead. Sorry. I'm saying the whole concept, the family concept, where Arabs' concepts on, on. If you look at the disaster of what has happened to black, the black American Muslim community, to so many masses and families throughout the country, a lot of it's rooted in trying to import a culture that's not yours. Definitely. So they're getting family and marriage advice to people that are married to their cousins and, and going back generations. Uh, what Imam Wartha D. Muhammad understood was a lot of fiqh, a lot of quote unquote Muslim culture was not applicable to the black American experience. He had to develop an Islam that was conducive to the black American experience. Uh, and I'll say this is true of white Americans, Hispanics, others. And so you cannot import the culture of Nej or the culture of Sindh or the culture of Sudan or Egypt on the people on the south side of Chicago and the north side of Philadelphia and in East Oakland. No, definitely can't. You know, if, if too short takes you hotter tomorrow, <laughs> you, can't, you can't turn him into an Arab in six months, which is what a lot of the Dawah effort in the 90s was. Which really in the black community, I think, has made Islam look, uh, has given Islam a black eye in, in the black community because you don't see as many converts. I believe more so in the UK because uh, it's, it's not popular more... here. Yeah, it's the not... data buries it out. When they did the mosque study, the data is buried out. The black community is shrinking. And those numbers are only being obscured by African immigration. If you take yeah. away African immigration, black Islam America is basically in a free fall. Yeah. And that's one thing that Ahmed, uh, Imam Lukman Ahmed, which you actually turned me on to his work as well, uh, mm-hmm. from his uh, book on Salafia, Devil Deception, to his uh, more recent one, uh, Double Age Slavery. But he had also mentioned that the numbers of Black converts in America are basically cooked up and not yeah. like and not what they present themselves as. And you know, that's another thing I wanted to talk about is the converts. Well, hold on a second. I'm saying you go to cities like St. Louis, Memphis. Um, very black cities, okay, Cleveland, Cincinnati, you know, at the maximum in each of those cities, you're going to find two to 300 African-Americans at Juma on a Friday, not, and probably not even that, you know, maybe 150, mm. right? So this myth that this is this huge African-American community is really a myth that's not backed up by data. You know, I mean, you know, um, I mean, look at the city of Atlanta, mm. the black Mecca, black Hollywood, even there, which has one of the more vibrant black American Muslim communities. If Islam was as strong as they said it was, there'd be 100,000 African-Americans in Juma on Friday. Mm. You know, and there's probably okay. a thousand, if that. And that's just, I mean... That makes me wonder then how many people were going to Juma uh, in, your, in, 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 you know, back in the 90s when you first converted. Was, was well, it the more- thing is, it was since it was growing, you know, like new people were coming in and there was a sense that it was growing. So uh, in St. Louis, not as many, but when you'd go to Philadelphia or New Jersey or New York City or the D.C. Metro, the matches would be packed. Yeah, we used to see people, uh, pictures of people praying in the streets, uh, you know, holding right. service in the streets. It's places like Washington, D.C. And, and Philly and stuff like that. And because uh, of that, and, and, and because of that, in the last 10, 15, 20 years, they've built so many more new masjids, uh, big masjids. And, and most of those masjids are probably going to last a generation or two. Before you closing know? down. Yeah, like you got in St. Louis right now, has this huge... Used to be a very Catholic city. There's a restructuring of the Catholic Church here. They've closed so many big, beautiful Catholic churches. 
in St. Louis City and St. Louis County. Uh, and this happens all the time, churches close, synagogues close. Uh, you know, as the Muslim American community matures in America, you're gonna see an era where these, a lot of these big masters are gonna close. Mm. And uh, one thing I would like to discuss, uh, and you have brought it up, and it caused a bit of uh, controversy, but I don't know why, because I've heard this from um, one Muslim scholar, and Imam Lukman Ahmed had mentioned something similar to what you had said as well, is that uh, converts shouldn't be taken seriously. Uh, you, you said it in a more, I don't want to say comical way, but in a more yeah. straightforward, raw way, but I definitely yeah. understood what you meant by that, because uh, one um, scholar, uh, a university academic Muslim I follow online, Adis Duraja, mentioned something similar, that learning from learning Islam from converts should be avoided as much as possible, and he, and he yeah. gave a a list of various reasons. And Imam Lukman had mentioned that it takes approximately five years for the average convert to settle into a certain um, understanding of Islam. And even for myself, uh, having been Muslim for almost 10 years now, um, when I look at from where I started to where I'm at today, I've gone through phenomenal changes. I mean, imagine if someone had a, took on or took seriously what I had said uh, two years into being Muslim, uh, only for me to change, totally flip on that position exactly. two years later. You know, so I exactly. totally understood where you was coming from, but people made it seem as if you were trying to, uh, although you mentioned you don't encourage, but you don't discourage either. You know, you, right. you let people come to their own. But those are two separate issues, and let me address them both separately since you brought yeah. the other one up. Number one, I don't think you should take converts too seriously of any religion, because all religions have this problem. And mm -hmm. the Catholic Church is what they call the rad trads, the radical traditionalists. And a lot of these are converts. You see in the Orthodox Church in America, a lot of converts who tend to be inspired by Vladimir Putin and right-wing politics. Mm -hmm. um, and they come in, and it's the same MO. They come in with zeal. They say, oh, the, 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 we go to church, and they're all just ethnic. You know, they're sellouts. They're weak. They're too ethnic. They're culture, not religion. So Muslims just do the same thing you see other converts do. Uh, but because of the low self-esteem and white privilege and white supremacy, a lot of white converts in particular come in and uh, people, uh, you know, brown nose, kiss their ass, right? And uh, they, they give them a platform. Uh, you know, you got people that are, mo uh, I've seen white Muslims that are Muslim a year or less and on the board of directors of their masjid mm. that are um, leading campaigns within the Muslim community. We know that CARE has, as a policy, has sought to hire as many white converts as possible. Mm. Uh, uh, to give it uh, Islam a nice and friendly and white uh, space, uh, a face. Um, and I've seen so many of these converts, you look up in five years, they're not even Muslim, or they've radically changed their uh, uh, positions. Uh, and uh, there's this arrogance kind of rooted in racism mm. that uh, the convert knows more because they're not, um, they're not, um, uh, held back by culture, right? And this comes from the myth that there's a pure Islam, which there isn't, <laughs> and that uh, if you wipe away culture, you can get back to this pure Islam, uh, which is total, uh, uh, totally illogical and, and not rooted in anything uh, logical or substantial. Then you got um, uh, the arrogance of the new convert who comes in and it's like, hey man, these Arabs and Daisies and African, they don't know nothing, man. Let me you know, let, you know let, let, let me handle this. You know, it's like the, the classical paternalistic white liberal. Let me handle this. I got it. I know you're having a little problem. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm a smart guy. I, I can take care of this. And, um, um, and some of them are, are converting and then immediately getting into the more negative uh, segments of the Muslim community. I just saw this weird white Muslim guy in the UK. I mean, um, real loser. Uh, he's on there uh, egging on these Muslim Hindu riots and the and the protest over the Lady of Fatima uh, film um, screening in the United Kingdom. I mean, this guy is so illogical. If he believes a state should uh, police religious language, um, one of the first things they would do is you could outlaw conversion, and this guy wouldn't have even been able to convert to Islam. But mm -hmm. because he lives in a Western democracy, uh, he's free to convert. To, to any religion he chooses. He's free to leave any religion he chooses, and he's free to be a buffoon. 
Yeah. And so uh, this is the behavior you see for a lot of converts. Now, converts can speak on the Muslim convert experience very well. Mm. Okay. That's what, that's what converts should be taken seriously. Uh, because I see Dawah efforts, like there's one in Dallas, it's a good effort. But basically, it was to, the whole design is to turn Muslim converts into suburban Desi Muslims and socialize them within that culture, right? So it's still cultural. Uh, look, Muslim converts are still trying to figure things out. They may never figure things out. They're on a journey. They may not even stay Muslims. Yeah. Don't take them that serious and don't pimp them. Don't put them as your spokesperson uh, because we're seeing in America where uh, Islam is increasingly not seen as a religion, but an ethnic identity, a racialized identity, where religion is not important. And that kind of thing is not going to last more than a generation. You're not going to raise Muslim kids who are going to remain Muslims with that kind of mentality. And that's why I say these matches are going to be closing because, you know, you're not giving kids the right ingredients. Uh, religion in general, Christianity, Judaism uh, in America, the numbers have become smaller and more fundamentalist. So the only ones that are really able to hold on are the fundamentalist, uh, but the congregations are growing smaller. Now, as far as conversion, uh, it's quite simple. I, 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 I don't think conversion, I don't, I don't think data backs up Islam being a successful move for white Americans to convert to, mm -hmm. and increasingly not for black Americans. Uh, as well. If you're a black American, the only, the only uh, mass in your city is a storefront uh, full of uh, Salafis, uh, dysfunctional, nothing positive in their life, not building towards nothing positive, infighting, etc. That's not going to give you anything positive in your life. Uh, you're white American, you're not, there's no future in you cultural appropriating Desis and Arabs and, and, and you know, trying to pretend to be an Arab or a Desi. Um, there's no uh, you're never going to be fully accepted. People are always going to look at you with suspicion. And at the end of the day, as I believe, no religion has a monopoly on the truth. As I believe that uh, uh, it's not incumbent on anyone to convert in order to save themselves from the hellfire. You should, if you want to practice religion, and I don't think anyone's under any obligation to practice a religion, but if you want to follow a faith tradition, which I think is generally a good idea, uh, you should do the one is, which is the best sociological fit for yourself and for most white americans uh, that would be christianity mm. i mean, I mean hence me, you have a, a lot more white but muslim i just had this but for me for me i've been socialized in the muslim community so it's not a matter of um of i believe in a theological supremacy it's a matter of socialization and just generally uh uh i don't vibe with american christian culture or, or the church but in that socializing amongst Muslims, you, you definitely feel there, you, you feel that there's something there more so than than, say, uh, speaking about theological concepts and and stuff like that, because, you know, for uh, from what I understood religion to be uh, before this modern time is, is actually what you did in a community uh, as far as practices. It wasn't necessarily a set of, you know, you believe 150 things and in the moment you only believe 149, you're out. You know, it was it was more so of a of a communal thing in order to kind of right. foster faith. Positive positive religion is community. You're building a community to help you uh, live your life together. A community that would be there in good times, births and weddings, be there in bad times, sickness and funerals. A community that can give you ethical parameters and guidelines. Uh, a, a community you can experience brotherhood in, and it's an action oriented community. Um, uh, is deed not creed yeah. and so the the uh negative religion often falls in when the focus is on creed and argumentation over creed i mean you got people that will sit on the internet and argue you have whole youtube channels dedicated to where is allah or <laughs> these minor these minor theological issues which are of no benefit to anyone theological argumentation is of no benefit to anyone it's a complete waste of time it's a complete waste of your life but well, if you look at the Salafi Dawah, uh, it was entirely centered around correct creed, argumentation, and distancing from the deviance. So mm -hmm. the, 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 the ethos of Salafi is negativity in that it is uh, a condemnation of the majority of Muslims as being deviants. Can't right. go nowhere with that. 
No, and I definitely like how you uh, explain that. And that leads to my next topic, religion in uh, 21st century Muslim America, um, traditional learning, uh, traditional Islamic learning. Uh, wh wh where do you see that going um, in the future? I mean, just coming from your background, someone who was definitely rooted in traditional Islamic learning from the people that you've been around, and to someone who I've noticed more recently reading academic, uh, more more academic uh, works on uh, Islamic history. Uh, we're, we're right. going back to traditional Islamic learning. Where do you see that moving in the future in, within American Muslim communities? I see the Muslim community no different than the Christian and Jewish community uh, as immigrant generations assimilate into the United States um, and intermarry. There'll be more intermarriage. There'll be more Muslim women marrying non-Muslims um, and Muslim men marrying non-Muslims. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, increasingly having kids and grandkids that are not Muslim. So I see the Muslim community getting smaller. Um, I see the suburban mega mosques and others, WD mosques, et cetera, not making it 20, 30 years in the future. Um, but the Muslim community that will continue to exist, I think will be more fundamentalist. Just like you see with Chabad, you know, the Jewish organization in the mm -hmm. Crown Heights neighborhood of Brooklyn, or the Satmar Lubavitchers in, in, in Williamsburg, uh, or the these exurbs dominated by evangelical Christians or, you know, the, the traditionalist Catholics, I think the Muslim community will be smaller and it'll be more fundamentalist. And uh, as a part of that, um, traditional learning will be a part of that. Uh, you'll have those oriented towards Sufis and those oriented towards Salafis, but they will be, uh, you know, I think, you know, probably 10% of the maximum of 20% uh, of the Muslim community in America, which will be shrinking uh, in and of itself. But Muslims will permanently make uh, an impact, culture in America. You know, it didn't used to be mainstream to eat pizza in America or eat tacos. All immigrant groups bring something to the cuisine, bring something to the culture, bring something to the, to the language, and Muslims will make an impact, but devout religious Muslims uh, is contingent on a steady wave of immigration from Muslim countries. If mm -hmm. immigration dies down from Muslim majority countries, you're gonna see a shrinking of the Muslim community and, and, and an increasing uh, uh, assimilation. I think academic study is important because it shows you how the sausage is made. You know, when you're eating that delicious halal chicken <laughs> sausage or halal beef sausage, you don't necessarily want to know what it looks like in the slaughterhouse. Uh, when you are uh, lustifying over the, uh, the, the, uh, the big booty Instagram model twerking on TikTok and Instagram, uh, you know, you, you might say, hey, you know, she might have some surgery done. Well, you put it out of your mind. You know, it's not really <laughs> for your mind. You know, say you just want to see a clap. So the uh, 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 same thing with religion. A lot of what we know of as Islam, and the same thing with Christianity, uh, is modern. Uh, it's not historical. Um, how the religion came about to how we know it today, definitely is not uh, the religion that was, uh, you know, that was brought at that time, you know, it's definitely not a preserved 1400 year. It's changed, it evolved, people changed. Nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with that. Uh, but if uh, if your goal is to be in line with people in the Arabian Peninsula 1400 years ago and live how they live, first of all, it's impossible because yeah, you don't yeah. really have a fully accurate picture of how they practice or how they live. And second of all, it's negative. So what you gotta do with how do we make the essential truths, the essential things we believe to be true, uh, uh, how, do make, we, how do we make them applicable to our modern times and our modern lives? Uh, I've seen so many converts of my era. First, I've seen a lot of them leave, a lot. But the ones that stick around and are become so grumpy, so negative. You know, um, you know, you look at Mark Manley out in California, man, this guy is, I mean, I just want to tell him, smoke a blunt, man. <laughs> smoke a blunt. You know what I'm saying? Go to the strip club. Whatever you got to do, I mean, I mean, religion has a way. Christianity, Judaism, non character religion is of making people grumpy, of making people ah, oh, man, these people that are watching Netflix and having fun. They right. just hate people having fun. They they literally hate. Oh, this person went to a game. Don't they know they could have been studying Arabic? You know, they, they you know, uh, Jonathan Brown. One of the first things I heard about him was he was scheduling a lecture during the Super Bowl, which lets you know what kind of weirdos a lot of times are talking about. They're, they're kind of like these That's almost like dragons. a national holiday. Right, right. These Dungeon and Dragon weirdos, you know, I'm trying to say these guys that probably had no popularity whatsoever in school, you know, 
uh, and Islam kind of gives them a friend circle or whatnot. But um, religion has a way of making people so grumpy. And when you have that, you have negative religion. Definitely. Find something to be positive about, something to be happy about. Oh man, I, if Tori was great, some you know, of the brothers. And I really think that's the biggest argument against atheism. You know, it's not trying to debate uh, how you describe God or make God sound the most logical, but you show them up in by, by what you're doing. Show show that believing in God or practicing a faith tradition makes you uh, a, a better person, better inside, better outlook in life. Right. and stuff. Because if it's not making you better, what is it doing? If religion is making you a worse person, I'd argue religion is bad for you. Yeah, definitely. You might need to discard it. Okay. But, if, but the tools are there. We know for a fact the tools are what's inside to make you a better. We know that. Yeah. You know, I, guess, I just got a phone today with a friend of mine, Stone Gangster, East St. Louis, did uh, many years in, in prison in Illinois, took Shahada in prison, became a man in prison, got college, we got out, model citizen since then. Islam completely changed his life. And we know that it's happened. It's not happened a lot with the younger generations, but we know it happened a lot in the baby boomer generation, right? Definitely. And uh, 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 those people, uh, Islam has been very positive for them. But if Islam takes you to quit your middle class job, to go live in the mountains of Yemen, to go live in the slums of Cairo, uh, to go to Syria uh, through the terrorist organization, or just to generally be uh, cantankerous, fundamentalist, multiple marriages, um, dysfunctional fundamentalism, uh, anger towards the world, the religion is very negative for you. Yeah, definitely. It's a net negative. And it's probably the thing that's destroying your life. Definitely. And as it has for uh, so many people, especially within the last decade, um, since I became Muslim. And, you know, this is, leads to the last topic, which uh, actually is an excellent segue. Um, some uh, your, your recent trip to Israel, which for me seems like you're, you're uh, a Malcolm moment for you. you the Malcolm, how Mal right. uh, Malcolm's second trip to Mecca moment for you, being That's that right. you've been to Jerusalem, the, uh, you've been yeah. to Israel, Palestine one time and you had a different perspective and then you yeah. went back around a second time with a totally new perspective. So uh, I just Correct. wanted to, to touch on that a bit. And also if you can actually start with what kind of led or is this the moment that led to you considering taking the trip to Israel, uh, the water crisis in Jackson and who you had reached out to help? No, I'd already planned that, um, uh, but, but let me back up. I, I very much agree with you. I see it as a Balkan moment. Because to me, Malcolm is about evolution, about challenging understandings, challenging uh, pre-existing things you believe to be true. Uh, it's about evolving. You know, somebody remarked to me, "How could someone that write on Malcolm went to go to Israel?" You know, uh, because we have a we have a misunderstanding of what Malcolm was. You know, everybody claims Malcolm. Conservative, you know, black conservatives say Malcolm is the pulling up by the bootstraps guy. He's the ultimate conservative, right? Um, mm -hmm. Leftists would say, you know, he was an internationalist, you know, Pan-Africanist, Marxist. The uh, um, Muslims would say, you know, he was a, a, a fundamentally a Muslim role model and evolving towards an Islamic revival position, right? Uh, and, and, and all those things, there might be a little bit of truth and all those things, some falsehood, right? Because um, the, the fact of the matter is, Malcolm was moving so fast that even his own, as Abdurrahman Muhammad points out, that even his own followers were afraid to defend his position because his positions were changing so rapidly mm -hmm. that no one knows where Malcolm would have been in 1970 or 75 or the year 2000 or you know, however long he would live. So to me, the point you can take from Malcolm is self-improvement uh, and evolution, right? And, uh, and critique of America, all those things. Uh, it just so happens that my evolution uh, allowed me to see Israel in a different light. Mm. And when you talk about Israel, Muslims get very conspiratorial. Uh, Ilhan Omar, all, all about the Benjamins, right? I mean, this is someone that's making that who that who is openly not a serious practicing Muslim other than the hijab, right? Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, you cancel Norman Ali Khan for a corny text. And, uh, you know, when she's kicking it where, you know, and kicking it with her staff and dumping her Muslim husband, right? You know, so the hypocrisy that's out there. Um, 
so the Muslim can only think of Israel in terms of money, right? Mm -hmm. You look at Ilhan, and she's making a killing going to all these care banquets and you know stuff like that, right? So Muslim identity politics is very lucrative, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, all the white the white progressive is in love with the hijab, is in love with uh, the Muslim identity, not the religion of Islam, but the Muslim identity. So they're pumping a lot of Muslims. So a lot of Muslims in America are getting paid off of their Muslim identity. Mm -hmm. uh, so to say that Jews are the only people that spend money uh, <laughs> is, is, is absurd. I went to, um, to Israel, just very, very simple. It was very inexpensive. I got a COVID uh, check, you know, like on, uh, you know, from my uh, job. You know, they gave everybody a uh, because for, you know Obama, I mean uh, Biden gave like that block grants to cities, and the uh, city of St. Louis said that you know that they're going to hand out uh, checks to you know to citizens. I took my check, which was $2,500, and I said, I'm gonna take this trip. And I was under budget. I only spent about you know, $2,200, $2,300. So it was very inexpensive. Uh, traveling is not expensive. I could fly to London right now and by rail could go see 10 or 15 countries in Europe. I could probably do it for two or three grand. So yeah. traveling is not as expensive uh, as, as, as people, um, uh, people, people make it out to be. Uh, Jerusalem is, is to me is the most fascinating place on the earth. Um, I'm in love with Jerusalem. I've been in love with Jerusalem since the first time I saw it. Mm. Uh, it's a special place. It's a truly special place. Um, and um, I have a great respect for Jewish tradition. I have a great respect for the Jewish faith. Uh, and when I was in Poland, I went to Auschwitz. Uh, I went to the Jewish Community Center of Krakow. Uh, to bring them donations for Ukrainian refugees. Um, and uh, I view uh, Israel as a very vibrant and interesting place. There are political uh, issues that are very difficult, but I believe that the unique negativity people have towards Israel is rooted in anti-Semitism mm. because the human rights record of Israel is certainly better than any of its Arab neighbors. There's no BDS of Egypt. Uh, even though um, you know there's a lot going on there that we can speak of, uh, you know, etc. So the, the there's a unique vitriol towards Israel that's rooted in two things: number one, anti-Semitism; uh, some of it in leftist uh, politics. Uh, but the, but the major thing is in the in the hurt of the, of the Muslim, mm. hurt the pride of the Muslim. It is damaging to the pride of Muslims that this small nation the size of New Jersey made up of a diaspora from throughout the world that Muslims could not erase Israel from the face of the map. Mm -hmm. Israel was outgunned, outmanned. There was no way Israel should have won this war of independence. No way on paper it should have won. And Israel came out victorious after all the Arab neighbors tried to push it into the sea. In 67, Gamal Abdel Nasser and uh, Hafez al-Assad, they said, once again, we're going to push Israel into the sea, and then King Hussein of Jordan joined in, and the Six Day War happened, which was a huge victory for Israel, where the entire city of Jerusalem was captured, including the, the Temple Mount, where the Al Aqsa um, Dome of the Rock is. Mm -hmm. 73 again. So, militarily, Muslims have failed to be victorious against Israel. And today, if there was any kind of military conflagration between Israel and any Muslim country, it would be an absolute disaster for the Muslims because Israel is a military superpower. Mm. It's an economic superpower. It's a high-tech nation. And there's just no Muslim military that can compete. Um, so the only thing you can do then is pity party and to um, uh, uh, file this other track, BDS, etc. cetera. Uh, but what many Arabs and Muslims have saw is there's no future in this belligerence towards Israel. Yeah. And this is how you get the Abraham Accords. So normalization with Morocco, with Sudan, Egypt, Jordan, United Arab Emirates, Saudi, excuse, Saudi Arabia soon. They basically have it, but it's not official. When MBS gets the throne, it will be official. Mm -hmm. Bahrain, etc. And there will be a time in a not so different future where Israel has diplomatic relations with all Arab and Muslim neighbors. Arab, uh, Israel's a fact, is not going away. 
and uh, Imam Wartha D. Muhammad went to the Western Wall. Imam Wartha D. Muhammad prayed at the Western Wall, just like I did. And I don't think there's any better intellectual role model, not to say you have to follow everything he said, than Imam Wartha D. Muhammad. Because no, we used to look at him. Agree. Yeah, we, look, we used to look at him as a sellout. And we used to call them WD people, wobbly deaners, you know what I'm saying? And But really, he had it. He hit the nail on the head. We are not Arabs. We cannot follow these cultures. They're not our cultures. And it's only going to create confusion. Uh, if we try to, we have to create an Islam that is applicable to our situation, that is in line sociologically with our situation. And uh, we have no conflict with Israel. We have no conflict with anybody. Yeah. Our lives, our dreams, our love, and our aspirations are here in the United States of America. So we have to find a way of being a positive influence in the United States of America, raising healthy families in the United States of America, uh, being upright and moral citizens. Not that we don't challenge, because the lesson of Malcolm is we challenge, mm -hmm. we challenge, and we agitate, and we call for a better America. Yeah. But we're rooted uh, in this American tradition, but we're rooted in love. And, and this concept of Ummah, and we have to be in solidarity uh, and jihad with our fellow Muslims in Kashmir, in Palestine, uh, in Chechnya, in Bosnia, et cetera. That is something that has only brought persecution and harm to American Muslims and caused, you know, my friend Ismail Royer, so many other Muslim brothers lost years of life in prison over this negative. We can't look at that that way. Now, we can look morally and ethically as humans and say, we don't agree with certain policies of Israel, or we don't agree with the concentration camps Uyghurs are being put in to in China, or we don't agree with many different things throughout the world. We can do all of that, but we have to do it within a healthy and productive and legal framework where we address our concerns uh, you know, through social media, mm -hmm. through our elected officials, uh, through the recognized uh, process and not by playing cowboy uh, and, and you know, jihad, you know, jihad, jihad and stuff like that. We ha if you're going to have a healthy religion, uh, you have to discard all that uh, uh, jihadi internationalism uh, to have a positive experience. That's going to bring you nothing positive in your life. It will destroy your life and it will destroy your family. Oh, and it destroyed many, many lives from what I was witnessing that 2016 or 2015 to 2017 period when all the stuff that was going on in Syria and ISIS, how many people from the West went yeah. out there, uh, you right. know, either got killed, got captured, went to yeah. jail, still trying to get back uh, with That's some right. people, um, you know, it's just totally. By the way, I think the UK should accept them back if they're British citizens. Yeah, I believe so as well. I, and the reason I say that, if they were white and uh, they went to go fight for Vladimir Putin, uh, they would be let in, mm. right? Uh, um, what's her name, Begin? What's her name? Uh, uh, Shemima Begin. Shemima Begin. She was radicalized in the United Kingdom. Yeah. She was born and raised there. She was still in the United Kingdom. UK needs to come collect their trash. Okay. Yeah. Was she an idiot? Yes. If you hear her interviewed, she's not very smart. You know, she's not very smart at all, right? But I think that uh, uh, she has no other state, and I believe the United Kingdom is legally and ethically bound to take her back and to take others. Now, if they want to prosecute them, if there's laws in the books to prosecute them, if they want to monitor them, um, they want to see, I think all of them should have their passports seized and all of them should be monitored. Yeah, yeah. And all of them, um, and some of them, they're involved in violence, should be incarcerated. But I believe states, are legally obligated, including the United States of America, to pick up their trash. Oh, definitely. Especially being that they let some of that rhetoric uh, fester on the UK streets for so long with Anjum okay. Chowdhury and other uh, speakers like him, uh, Sheikh Faisal okay. as well for, okay. for decades. Uh, Sheikh Faisal for about a decade. I don't know how long. Yeah, they let it fester. Gone. They let it fester. They didn't do anything about it. Um, you had a lot of progressives. Uh, like I saw this, uh, this idiot um, socialist in the UK uh, saying that he was uh, uh, supporting the Iranian government in its crackdown mm -hmm. against uh, the young women and young people protesting in the street. 
um, be, because of intersectionality, which I'm totally opposed to anyway, in the British intersectionality, that means white leftists um, carrying the water for Islamists, who are the uh, anathema of the left. Mm. They're trying to create a theocratic state uh, that would uh, incarcerate people just like him. But <laughs> this kind of voodoo political alliance means this guy uh, is in opposition to young people in the streets asking for the same freedoms they would have if they lived in the United Kingdom, which is the freedom to wear hijab or the freedom not to wear hijab, and much more. All right, and Umar, is there anything you would like to add uh, closing uh, from this? You can uh, follow me on Twitter uh, at Umar Lee 3, Roman numeral, at Umar Lee III. Uh, I also got TikTok. I got, uh, which I, I'm new to TikTok, so I'm just kind of learning it. Um, you know, and uh, uh, you can follow me on social media. I don't engage in, in uh, religious argumentation. You know, some neo-Taliban loser wants to come in and argue with me about, you know, some ridiculous point of theology, you know, shake so-and-so, you know, some inbred media will shake. I'm not here for it, okay? <laughs> uh, if, uh, um, if, um, uh, if you have a serious question, you can email me at umarli at gmail.com. And what about the, are you going to continue the commentary uh, on, on YouTube? I know you kind of, I mean, I know you, you upload every once in a while. You kind of slow, but are, are you thinking about picking that back I'm, up? I'm or? thinking about kind of like transition, doing a little bit of YouTube, but doing more stuff on TikTok. Because if you look at the data, TikTok is, is really growing in popularity. And, uh, uh, but uh, I will do some things on YouTube. Um, but, you know, I got the, you, I, my newsletter is what I'm really focusing on, on Substack. You got the Umar Lee newsletter. Mm. So, if I'm you gonna subscribe see the links to the, in the description for you. So yeah, yeah. If you subscribe to the Umar Lee newsletter, whenever I do a YouTube video, I'll put it on there. Uh, and so, like I say, some of my stuff, I'll strictly be focused on St. Louis, mm. and some of my stuff, you know, maybe Muslim content, and some of the stuff other. I'm not, I'm not trapped in the Muslim bubble. Mm. See, a lot of people. Uh, I remember Mark Manning said a few years ago, "You haven't did anything since the rise and fall." Well, I've done a lot. <laughs> I've done a lot. We shook the world in Ferguson, okay? We shook the world. You know what I'm trying to say? We were on television all throughout the world. We changed policy. We changed the region. We changed the country. You know what I'm trying to Definitely. say? But what I do isn't strictly confined to the Muslim circuit. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and just to, to end on this note, anybody who looks at what you're a part of outside of uh, the content that might be on social media will, will clearly yeah. see that you do think a lot of things behind the scene that that go unnoticed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was hoping to highlight some of those things in this conversation. I think I highlighted some of them, but I do encourage people to, to definitely look into your background before they judge you based off of some of the things you say that that is, is very raw and uncut at times. And I'm gonna tell you one thing is, if we, like I said with the Muslim community, you gotta look at the Muslim community is, the Muslim community is very classist, much more classist than the general American or British society, right? Mm. Uh, and so they believe that working class people should have no voice at mm. all in the Trinity. That's number one. Uh, that they got a STEM degree and they know everything. So just, just be quiet. America ain't that kind of party. <laughs> no. America, we celebrate the rebels. Yeah. We celebrate the independent thinkers. That's a part of American culture. We celebrate the underdog. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, number two, um, the theological fundamentalists are people who don't question. Mm -hmm. So they can't read the academic stuff on religion because they're too threatened. Yeah. We have a lot of scared little boys. A lot of scared little boys. If you think you have to protest outside of a movie theater because of a movie, you're a scared <laughs> little boy. If you think you have to go on stage and attack Salman Rushdie, you're a scared little boy. If your faith can't stand up to scrutiny and critique, you, you're not only a scared little boy, you have no place in the modern world. You might want to cut out the cousin of marriage in the next generation, widen the gene pool. Maybe you'll get, you know, a little more intelligence in the next generation. All right. And on that note, Umar Lee, thank you for joining me for this conversation. And hopefully in the future, we can have many more. Hopefully I'll see you in Greenwich Mean Oh, yeah, yeah, you definitely will, man.